May the Lord be blessed today. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. I was looking at this this morning, kind of in connection with what I talked about last week. The battle for our mind and here in Colossians chapter 1, notice verse 21. Paul says, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Jesus has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before the Father holy and blameless and beyond reproach. You know, we were looking at that last week about how we were unable to understand the thoughts of God and unable to even please Him because we had, you know, our natural mind, which is good and evil, and it's not capable of being pleasing to God. But because of the intervention of the cross and because of the reconciliation that we have in Jesus' body, we are we now we literally have a different mind and in verse 22 he says he's reconciled us through his body through death so that he could present us before the father holy and blameless and beyond reproach and so it changes the way that we not only the way that we see ourselves but we see each other we understand that uh I mean, it bears repeating over and over and over again. We're not pardoned criminals, but we are, we are a new creation. That we, as much as we can look at the cross and understand that that has no limit to its redemption, that's the hope that we have in our position with our Heavenly Father. That is the only way that we're able to Believe what he says. It's impossible. You cannot believe the promises of God unless you believe that you are the one he made them to. He says in verse 23, If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So you see, it's, it, it's something that happens often that Paul even, you know, he has to, give insight into that because it's it's easy to be moved away from the hope of the gospel and our hope always has to be tethered in that and it can't be you know it, it can't be tied to circumstance it can't be tied to the thoughts that you're having in any given moment it has to be tied to the hope your hope has to be tied to the the cross the gospel which we have heard and paul says which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, in which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now notice how he kind of ties what he was just saying, that we understand that we were enemies of God. We had a, different, a whole different mindset. Now we have the mind of Christ. We can understand his thoughts, and we know his promises are, are for us, and every intention that he has for us is only good. It's impossible for him to be anything but good. It's impossible for him to lie. It's impossible for him to do anything that is for our harm. And Paul says in verse 24, understanding that now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And these weren't, these weren't something that was quick. With Paul, you know, we get an insight on this, into somebody who had a lot of pressure put on him over a very long period of time. But he was able to maintain the hope that he had and keep the right thought life because he's, you know, he's, he saw the value and understood the purpose in it. That's when he says, I rejoice. I'm able to actually have joy in the midst of sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church and filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I spent a lot of time thinking about that scripture because it always was very, um, it's just a confounding statement that there. The work of the cross is fulfilled. Jesus left nothing undone, but also there is a part that we play in filling up Christ's afflictions. 
obviously that's what Paul is saying, that he rejoices and he does his part. Verse 25, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages, generations, but now has been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And again, you know, Paul is emphasizing hope, and that's what was on my mind this morning. You know, the hope that we have, it's not something, I mean, you're not born with it. You're not just, it's not something that's easy to hold on to. It, is, it takes an endeavor in order to protect, and that's why Paul was saying you have to continue, you have to be firmly established, because it's easy to get moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's easy to get, you know, distracted from the ultimate and all-encompassing work that Jesus has done. Now he has taken us, we didn't read it, you know, but in the first part of Colossians, Paul is explaining he's taken us from one kingdom to another. That, you know, we were those that were sitting in darkness and now we has, we can see the light, the, the light has come. And, you know, it's God's will to make known to us the riches of his glory. And I know we don't understand all of that, but as we saw last week, for so long people didn't know, but he made known to us through the Spirit. He wanted us to know the things that he has prepared. And it's our hope for glory. Verse 28, so we proclaim him, we proclaim Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. You know, that's the thing. It's like as long as we're on this earth, there's more work that we can do. There's a greater trust that we can hold and the one who's called us, you know, to be faithful to the one who's called us so that we can be complete. Verse 29, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, look at verse 9. Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. You know, that's one of the things that we have to tend to is what it is that we're convinced of, what it is that we have allowed to be assured in our heart. And Paul is saying, it's like we're convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way, even though, you know, there's warning about, you know, the danger that we're in, the enemy that we have, all of that is true. But you can be convinced that he who began a good work will complete it. Verse 10, For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. You know, for someone like Paul, who I believe wrote this book, for him to say, God doesn't forget. Because, you know, when he is making his defense there, you know, when his life is on the line, his physical life is on the line, he tells Timothy, you know, there was nobody. I was alone, you know. It seemed like everything that he had worked for had just fallen apart. But, you know, we, like Shane was mentioning in his prayer, we have the gift of being able to look back and see these, you know, couple thousand years later, and we see the impact that just someone who simply decided to follow Christ, whatever that meant, and to be faithful, the impact that it had on generations even. But, you know, in Paul's mind, what he was thinking of, I'm sure, is along these lines that, well, God doesn't forget 
and he's not unjust. And that statement, you know, is a very powerful one because constantly we're being offered that thought that God is unjust. We're constantly at different levels, depending on your personality type, probably uh, wondering why things have to be so difficult or why they have to be so complicated. And that can tend to, you know, it's like the scripture says, it warns us against fretting. Don't fret, it only leads to evil doing. That's not to say like you can't ever be sad or stressed out or anxious about something. Like that's all that stuff. We even see that in Jesus. But, you know, he he always had the correct response to it. And that was to remember what was real, what was eternal, contrasted with what was just for a moment. That's, you know, one of the things that Jesus said, like, you have sorrow right now when he was talking to the disciples because he knew what was going to happen to him and how it was going to affect them because they didn't understand what was going on. They weren't able to. But he said, you know, your, your sorrow will be turned to joy. It's just temporary. God's not unjust, and he doesn't forget. And there's not a single sacrifice that any of us have made that he does not take note of. Verse 11, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. You know, that's one of those things like God makes it available, but it is difficult to actually have like the full assurance of the hope that we have in Christ. You know, I know none of us here doubt the work of the cross, but oftentimes we don't have full assurance of the hope in the cross. It's that, you know, knowing and believing, you know, to know the love of God and then to go further and to actually like believe and receive it. You know, those are steps that we go through and you're in different places depending on what season you're in or what's going on, what God is doing, the growth that he's bringing in us. But that's the one thing that you always have to remember is that, you know, I was watching Emmy walk back there and I was just thinking about like how long it takes a child to learn how to walk well because he's been walking for a little while but you know he's he's not real super steady it's easy for him to fall over but the 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 amount of time that it takes him to be able to walk as well as he will is relative to how free he's going to be it's the it's the way that he will be able to walk because he has gone through you know fall after fall after fall and being unsteady for so long his the amount of freedom that he'll have once he does master that even though it takes a lot longer and just you know in connection with us you know all the things that the lord allows us to kind of muddle through uh, it is directly connected to what it is that he's wanting to bless with we see it happen over and over again you know the the way that the lord his the outcome of his dealings as the scripture calls it so we we're to show the same diligence so as to realize a full assurance of hope until the end that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises You know, Abraham is mentioned as, you know, one of those who waited patiently to obtain the promise. And down in verse 19, it says, you know, we have this hope that's set before us. It's an anchor of our soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. And it's because Jesus has gone before us. We understand that. Our position before the Lord is because of that and that alone. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, notice verse 19. Paul says, I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers 
the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, that's one thing. It's There's lots of stuff that we can't control. There's lots of things that are beyond our reach. But we can always make a choice, like Paul was saying here, to, to have Christ be honored, to be thankful, to hold that hope, and whether it means life or death, that the Lord will be honored, you know, because we have, we've already entrusted our life to Him. Verse 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. You know, Paul had a choice, and we all have a choice every day. Notice verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and in no way alarmed by your opponents. And this is a really interesting statement. When we do this, when we stand firm and we put you know, our faith in the work of the cross, it says, this is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too from God, you know, it's like God sees that and, you know, it is, that distinction is made so clear, you know, this is our sign of salvation that we can be assured. Notice verse 29, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, notice verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, there's times that you feel helpless. You can point back at that and you can say, well, when I was like beyond a shadow of a doubt, completely helpless, Christ died at the right time for my sake. When he mentions that, you know, it's, it's, it's directly following what he had just explained about how we come to have hope. Because, you know, it's through difficulty and perseverance and changes your mindset, the way you think and your character, and then you're able to have hope that's actually enduring. And that's when he says, look, and that hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God's been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that's, you know, he reminds us, it was like while you were helpless, it, it was then that Christ died for us, for ungodly people. Verse 7, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. You know, that it's, it's not just, that's Paul's making the distinction there. It's not just that God had mercy on you, but then he took it further and made sure that you knew that you were corrected, that you were justified, that you were completely redeemed. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. 
much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You know, this is, this is how you can have hope. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm.